Well, thank you, Mark. Um, those were powerful stories from God's Word. And yes, uh, a very long passage. Uh, but, but these mighty acts all work together in a mighty way to communicate a mighty message that we all need to hear. It's so good to turn around and see you guys. Uh, this is a message about the good news of Jesus Christ. That's where we're going today as we dig a little bit deeper in these stories. But, but first, welcome. Uh, it, it is wonderful to see each of you here and, and to have uh, many of you join online. Uh, I hope your family is healthy and happy right now. I, I, I know this latest strain of COVID has been making the rounds. It, it hit our home again uh, <laughs> a little over a week and a half ago. And, and we're, we're grateful to God that, that uh, we're, we're all on the mend. Uh, but never hesitate to share your prayer requests. Uh, I know that there are cards there in the pew backs right in front of you. Uh, please, please do that. It, you know, and, and for those of you online, uh, you can uh, submit prayer requests on the website or, or through the app. We, we must, must continue to hold one another up in prayer uh, during these chaotic times. And, and these are chaotic times, aren't they? I mean, COVID has, has brought in a whole new level of chaos in, in health care, in, in the economy, in education, uh, interpersonally. Uh, opinions abound uh, over all kinds of things like mask mandates and infection rates and mental health and vaccines and any number of other things. Ch chaos is the best word, I think, to describe all of it. Uh, the political divide in our country has also created chaos in the news and in communities, even sometimes uh, within families. Uh, threats of war in Eastern Europe and missile testings in North Korea, they add to the chaos. And all of that stuff, that doesn't even address the internal chaos that many of us are plagued by. Questions about our own health or our identity or our future relationships, careers, families, even our beliefs. Uh, you know, there's so much information out there, so many options, so much pressure, so much noise around all of us. It, it is so difficult to find peace. The only way to describe it is chaotic. Well, friends and fellow travelers on this journey through the chaos, the good news is that our long-awaited King, Jesus, has come to take on the forces of evil, even to confront death itself, to give us life and blessing. In short, as we'll see in our Scriptures for today, Jesus came to deliver us from the chaos to calm. From the threat of death, well, we pick up today again in the Gospel of Mark uh, with a, a unit dedicated entirely to the miracles of Jesus. And those of you who have been with us uh, through this journey for a little while now, you're, you're thinking, oh, didn't you skip over a little bit there, Andy, at the beginning of chapter 4 where Jesus taught about the kingdom of God and parables? And I'm actually going to come back to one of those parables next week. But I wanted to kind of wrap up our initial investigation of the good news by looking at the overarching message of these mighty acts of Jesus. Specifically, Jesus calming the storm at the end of chapter 4. Jesus delivering a, a, a man possessed by numerous demons um, in the beginning of chapter 5. Then the sandwich stories kind of mixed together there of uh, Jesus healing uh, the, the woman who had been bleeding for over 12 years, having exhausted all of her resources along the way, and Jesus raising a little girl from the dead, concluding chapter 5. And you might wonder, uh, didn't Mark already spend a fair amount of time showing how Jesus combated evil spirits and healed diseases? This sounds like more of the same. As if you could ever get tired of those things, right? Uh, but yes and, and no. Remember the central question that, that Mark is trying to answer with his story. 
Who is this Jesus? That, that's the big mystery. And as readers, we, we know that Jesus is the Son of God. He's the promised Messiah. He is the long-awaited King. But even as the, the people in the story, their eyes are, are beginning to open slowly. What we have here in these four back-to-back-to-back-to-back miracles blows every expectation that they may have had. Just sheer. Just out of the water. These miracles, these mighty acts are so far beyond what anyone could have possibly imagined that they put Jesus on par with God Himself. And I think that's the point. Uh, Who else could change an entire weather system with a word? Or expel thousands, a legion of demons from a man? Or heal a woman instantly whose condition that all medical professionals had been stumped by for years, and he didn't even engage her? Who else could bring a corpse back to life? Only God. Only God can do that. But there is more here. And in the end, it has the potential to be very, very good news for us. And I I am indebted to a seminary professor of mine, Dr. Joe Donjel, who's teaching, helped me see some of the connections uh, between these four miracles. And I encourage you, follow along in your message notes that you were handed on your way in. And those of you online, they're always available on the app um, every single week. So uh, instead of looking at these miracles one at a time, uh, chances are you've done that uh, at another time. But, but I want to talk you through the things that seem to be present in each of these miracle stories, either explicitly or in a couple of cases implicitly. And I think these commonalities provide hope and encouragement for us as we find ourselves in need of deliverance from chaos to calm. So that's where we start. Right, Every one of these stories has some element of chaos. Well, let me just rehash some of these situations. Uh, and, and you tell me if they sound a little chaotic to you. Uh, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Sounds chaotic to me. Yep, check. Uh, regarding the possessed man, no one could bind him anymore. Not even with a chain, for he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Folks, that is more chaos than I ever want to experience. Check. Uh, the, The bleeding woman. Um, she grabbed Jesus' garment um, in the midst of a chaotic scene that the Scriptures simply described this way. A great crowd followed Jesus and thronged about Him. I mean, even, without, uh, even before COVID, crowds like that could be a little chaotic, right? And if you've ever been, and I know some of you have been, in, surrounded uh, in a situation by unexpected death, It can be very traumatic. Here's how the Scriptures described it. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. I think you can imagine the chaos. But that's not all. Um, Each of these scenes is not just filled with chaos, but also with the threat or the actuality of death. The storm was thrashing the boat and the disciples felt like they were going to perish. The the possessed man, he actually lived among the tombs. (laughs) He was naked, bound with chains, had no rest as he cried out night and day and he harmed himself. Torment and death were the goals of these demons. The, The bleeding woman was sick destitute, excluded from the community because of her uncleanness. I mean, that was, that was a part of the Jewish law regarding vaginal bleeding. Her, her trajectory was death. The lifeblood was going out of her. 
And of course, the little girl had already died. Chaos and threats of death were the backdrop for each of these miracles. And you know what? I I think they're the backdrop of our lives too, aren't they? Uh, Let's make this personal a little bit. A question for you. What, What chaos, what threats do you need to be delivered from? What is your backdrop? What, what, what are the things that are, that are pressing on you in such a way that, that, that you feel like maybe you could crack? What, what about your present circumstances don't just need a little tweaking, a little changing, but need intervention, deliverance? You know, it could be something far beyond your control. Maybe it's just the accumulation of all the stress and the pressure of your life. Of course, it could be some personal sin, some habit that is consuming you. Now, I've just noticed the overall anxiety of people these days is, has just gone up and up and up. It's almost like when all this other stuff is out of our control, we, we grasp on, we try to control the things that are close to us. Oftentimes, things that are really good gifts from God, things like a spouse or or family, or, or even uh, your career. And, and, and when, you, when you do that, a lot of times, it, it just, just the, the pressure of the, your expectation and your attempt to control just uh, squashes those things. It can crush them. And, and yet, we have so, such high anxiety as we try to just wrap our hands around the things that we feel like are within our grasp. You know, what's the chaos for you? What, what is the threat that you need to be delivered from? Do your best to name it. I mean, just as chaos and death were the backdrops of Jesus' miracles in these stories, your backdrop of chaos and death could be the setting of a miracle of Jesus in your life. But that's going to require something. Uh, namely, faith. And a call for faith is another common element in each of these stories. After Jesus calmed the storm, he asked the disciples, hey, why do you still not have faith? In the story of the possessed man, we don't see it in a direct indication of his faith. It's hard to kind of tell with this possessed man what is his will and what is the will of the demons that were inside of him. But you know what? He did run to Jesus. He did want to remain with Jesus after his deliverance, regardless of the faith that he may or may not have had beforehand. This miracle, as well as the the one with the disciples in the boat, show us that sometimes Jesus is willing to deliver before we exhibit faith. We'll respond with faith after the deliverance, like this man did. It's definitely easier to see faith in the story of the bleeding woman. I mean, Jesus actually commends her for her faith. I mean, her confidence in Jesus was so great that she believed that if she just touched his garment as he walked by, that she would be healed. And Jairus. And Jairus, even after he was told that his daughter was dead, still welcomed Jesus to come to his home. It's like he cracked the door open just enough to have a ray of hope shine through in a dark situation. That's faith. But simultaneously competing for our attention in the midst of big faith or small faith is something else. Fear. You can, see it. You, you can see it is present in each of these stories. The disciples, <laughs> you got to love them. They were terrified while the storm was going on, and they were terrified after Jesus calmed it. They were just afraid. Uh, after Jesus healed the possessed man, and, and the townspeople saw him in his right mind, and after hearing what had happened to the pigs, they were so afraid, they wanted Jesus to get out of there and take his mighty acts with him. The woman had fear too, and rightfully so. She was, she was breaking the law by bringing her uncleanness into a crowd. A- anyone who 
touched her would, uh, would be made unclean too. And when Jesus realized that she had touched him and then he turned to her, she was so afraid that the Scriptures say that, that she was trembling. And Jesus sensed Jairus' fear. He sensed it and he tried to calm his fear by saying, don't be afraid. Just believe. So another personal question for you. As you consider your chaotic or threatening situation, where do you need to let your faith overcome your fear? Acknowledge your fears. Well, what are you afraid of? If you could name it, is it, is it being let down? Is it maybe losing something that's important to you? Maybe it's having, having to, to change in a way that you don't feel like you're ready to. Maybe you're afraid of how others will react to the faith that you exhibit. What are you afraid of? I identify your fears. Name them. We're going to talk about the faith portion of things in a little bit, but first it's important for you and me to be honest about our fears. Because on the other side of those fears waiting for us on the other side of those fears, if we overcome them by faith, waiting for us is deliverance. Deliverance that comes in the form of being delivered from chaos to peace and calm. That sounds amazing, doesn't it? Almost amen-worthy, wouldn't you say? I, I, please don't leave me hanging there. I, I'm not the only one here today for whom peace and calm sounds like a much-needed miracle, am I? Okay, uh, certainly not. You know, in, in the boat, Jesus got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet! Be still! And the wind died down, and, the, and it was completely calm. Come on now, you could use some of that, couldn't you? Couldn't you? Yeah, remember the demon-possessed man. No, no chain could hold him. He was continually crying out night and day. He had no peace. He tried to hurt himself. Uh, and After Jesus cast out the demons, word got around. And we read that, that people came to Jesus and they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind. Oh, this man was so grateful for the peace that Jesus had given him that he went to many cities proclaiming all that Jesus had done for him. He had been delivered. And he had been given that inner, inner peace. That is worth gold. I, I know you know what I'm talking about. That surrounded this unexpected death. Jesus entered the room and he said, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. And they laughed at him. And I love this part. After he put them all outside, <laughs> he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was and he took her by the hand and he said to her, Talitha Kum which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. Can you imagine the parents' exhale of relief and the peace that would have overcome them in that moment? I can. And all I can say is praise God for that kind of peace that only He can give. You know, Jesus wants to deliver you from your chaos to that kind of peace and calm too. You know, it might not be deliverance from the outer chaos, but it can certainly be a deliverance from your inner unrest. However, as we see in this final section of Scripture, to be delivered from this chaos to calm, something is required of us. Now you may have wondered why this last story was connected with these four miracles. 
Uh, it's oftentimes labeled as Jesus' rejection in his hometown. Uh, but here's the scene. Jesus returned with his disciples to Nazareth, to his hometown. And he began to teach in the synagogues on the Sabbath as he normally did. And people acknowledged his great wisdom. And they acknowledged that he had performed these mighty works by his own hand. But they also undermined him and they took offense to him. Now listen to Mark's assessment here, beginning in verse 5. He, Jesus, could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith. Jesus couldn't do miracles here. Oh, he brought some healing, but he could not do his mighty work. And the connection is clearly made here that he couldn't do that work because of their lack of faith. Now, this is really worth wrestling with. Because just a couple of verses previously, we read that they acknowledged that he had great wisdom. And they acknowledged that he had actually performed these miracles with his own hands. So it seems like they at least have some level of belief, some level of faith. But I think Mark measures true faith as something a little bit deeper than intellectual assent or acknowledgement. Do you believe enough to act on what you believe? Do you believe enough to put your faithful action behind it? I mean, the disciples in the boat, despite all of their fears and their doubts, they came to Jesus to be saved. The demon-possessed man, he ran to Jesus. And later, he, after being delivered, he exhibited great faith as a response. The bleeding woman's faith overcame her fear and she sought Jesus and touched Him. Jairus, he came to Jesus in faith, and even after his greatest fears were confirmed that his daughter had died, he still left room for hope. He acted in faith. You know, true belief, real faith is willing to act. Not, not just acknowledge the possibility of, but to act in faith based on the promises of God. You know, it takes faith to follow Jesus and to follow His ways even when it leads you out of your comfort zone. It takes faith to confess your sin and to repent of it, to turn from it so that you don't continue to live in sin. It takes faith to give sacrificially. It takes faith to not just believe that you need people, but to put yourself into community with other people. It takes faith to carve out time for investment in, in your own growth, in your own discipleship, time that could be spent in any number of other ways. It takes faith to put aside your own agenda to serve other people. It, it takes faith to share about the way Jesus has delivered you, e even if you know other people are going to laugh or scoff at you because of it. It takes faith to say no to the expectations of others in order to say yes to God's call. It takes faith to act. Instead of just thinking about it or talking about it. And it's that kind of belief, that kind of faith that leads to the inner peace. That inner calm that Jesus' mighty work can bring you. So, one final set of questions for you today. Since, since true belief and real faith is all about trust, are you willing to trust Jesus? In what ways do you need to entrust yourself to Jesus? Well, what are your next steps of trust? How do you need to act in faith in Christ so that He can deliver you from chaos to calm? You know, these great stories of Jesus' mighty acts, they're tempered a little bit by the reality that you and I, just like the people in Nazareth, have a choice. Will we trust Jesus? Will, will we not just acknowledge His wisdom and mighty acts? Will we trust Him? That is an important question that each of us must answer in order for the good news of Jesus Christ to become good news for us. So over the next few weeks, we're going to take a look at some situations that Mark paints a picture of and some teachings of Jesus 
that reinforce this choice that we have and hopefully will encourage us to choose wisely. That's where we're going, uh, but, but right now I would love to pray for you to let your faith overcome whatever fears you may have in trusting Jesus today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I, I trust that you see how much chaos rules most of our lives. And I believe with my whole heart that you have great compassion and love for us and that you long to deliver us from chaos to calm. Lord, I trust your word when it says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. So Father, we come before you and I, I lift up my brothers and sisters in faith as, as well as myself and simply ask for the gift of faith to trust you enough to act on what we know and believe about you. Each of the people in these miracle accounts, each of them were desperate. Lord, help us long for your deliverance and the peace that you can bring that we would run to you. That whatever fears we have are overshadowed by our faith and our trust in you. You know, some of us here today, I, I, I get the sense that we know exactly what step of faith we need to take. But we need your spirit to move in us to overcome our fear. So Lord, move in us, we pray. We do not want to be those who acknowledge your greatness, but do not trust you enough to follow you. Instead, Lord, would you help us recognize how desperate we are, just like the disciples in the boat, just like the man possessed, just like the bleeding woman, just like Jairus. Help us recognize our desperate need for you so that we move toward you, both in our hearts and through our faithful, practical action. We want to see your mighty works in our lives. For we pray it in the name of Jesus who makes it possible. All of God's people agreed and said, Amen. Amen.